Welcome to the Nourish Child Podcast, a show about childhood nutrition, feeding kids, and dealing with the ups and downs of growing a healthy child. Here's your host, registered dietitian and childhood nutrition expert, Jill Castle. This episode of the Nourish Child is sponsored by Beef Farmers and Ranchers. Help your baby get the iron they need while celebrating family favorites like Taco Tuesday. Beef is one of the best sources of heme iron for infants and toddlers. Simply puree, mash, chop, or shred to meet their stage of development. Visit beefitswhatsfordinner.com for recipes the whole family can enjoy. Welcome back, everyone, to The Nourish Child. I'm Jill Castle, your host. Today, we're talking about iron and brain development in very young children. And to help us learn about this, I have a very special guest to share with you. But before I introduce him, I want to let you know this podcast episode is a collaboration between The Nourish Child and Beef It's What's for Dinner, a contractor to the Beef Checkoff. As a nutrition consultant to the National Cattlemen's Beef Association, on behalf of the Beef Checkoff, my role is to share the science and support for beef's role in a healthy diet. Today's episode uh, and the show notes will be available on the nourishchild.com forward slash 158. That's episode number 158, and that is forward slash 158. With me today is Dr. Michael Georgieff, a professor of pediatrics and child psychology. I love that combination. And he's the director of the Center for Neurobehavioral Development and the co-director of the Masonic Institute of the Developing Brain at the University of Minnesota. Dr. Georgieff's work focuses on fetal and neonatal nutrition, in particular, the effect of iron on brain development and cognitive function. He has published over 250 scientific articles and advises the American Academy of Pediatrics, the National Institutes of Health, and UNICEF on nutrition and early child development. I am totally geeking out to have him here on the show. I kid you not. Welcome to the show, Dr. George F. Hi, Jill. Thanks. That's great. Thank you for the very kind introduction. I've been a big fan of yours, too, so this will work out just great. Awesome. So tell us tell us about your journey to becoming a researcher and how you ended up focusing on iron. Yeah, I you know, it's funny. I I actually was uh, thought I was headed for a career in pediatric neurology. I had even as a kid, I was always interested in, you know, why people make the decisions they make and all the psychology and so on. And, you know, in retrospect, it was probably a lot of where we say research is me search, you know, as, as an adolescent. <laughs> And so I was a psychology major in in college, and uh, and decided to go to medical school. And through that, I, I thought, well, yeah, I'll probably become a brain scientist or something like that. And but what I realized was that first of all, a lot of brain is, development is pretty pre-programmed, especially early in life. Uh, and but the things that we can control that could help or hurt brain development would be. Uh, external environmental things like stress or nutrition or, you know, nurturing and so on. And if you ask the question kind of, well, when does that all start? Back then, when I was a a young pup, I guess, we thought that started with the baby. You know, the baby was just a blank slate. And so I started, uh, I went into what's called neonatology, which is newborn intensive care medicine. Uh, those babies obviously suffer from a lot of stress and some malnutrition and so on and so on. And I thought, well, good, we can make a positive effect going forward. That led to nutrition because, after all, that growing brain just takes a tremendous amount of energy to grow it. You know, as you and I are sitting here talking, the developing our brain takes about 20% of our total calories that we consume. It's a lot. I mean, yeah. it's a big organ up there, right? In a baby, Sixty percent. Wow. 60% of the calories that a baby consumes goes up to that brain because that's what the cost of growth is. So it kind of became a natural progression to say, all right, well, nutrition is something we can do something about. And iron just happens to be one of the nutrients that's really important for brain development. There are a whole bunch of them, but I settled in on iron. Yeah. 
Um, it is pretty remarkable, everything that's going on in the brain. And it's really a lifespan thing. But when we're talking about concentrating our conversation around infants, and we're really talking about the first 1000 days. And some of our listeners who are mostly parents and healthcare professionals may not understand what the first 1000 days are. So I would love for you to explain that and also then tie that into what we know about iron in that mm-hmm. time frame. Yeah. So kind of to continue the story, it turned out that the baby isn't born with a blank slate. It turns out that fetal experience is very important. And a perfect example of that in, in child development is that a newborn baby can tell uh, its mom's voice from a stranger's voice, day one. So yeah. that tells you what? It tells you that the brain is actually hooking itself up and that they've heard that voice in utero, in the womb, and have already encoded it. So that tells us that nutrition or any other environmental factors are probably important before the baby is born at term. And people have now mapped out when these systems come on board. For example, we know that that part of the brain that does that type of memory work is already there at 28 weeks gestation. So, you know, six, seven, about seven months. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, so the first thousand days, therefore, isn't a thousand days from term birth. It's from conception to about two years of age. And that's been what we call a paradigm shift. People have started now thinking of, <laughs> and parents don't like this, but birth is just kind of an event in there, but the brain development <laughs> is kind of just continuing along. Um, so that's the first thousand days. Now, the reason that's important is, and, and you already alluded to it, is that an enormous amount of brain development takes place in those first thousand days. If you look at a map of the developing brain, <clears throat> 90, 95% of it is, is, is in that time period. And then there's a second peak out in adolescence where, and you know, where you have another big spurt of brain growth. And what we know from all the studies that have been done is that it's those growth spurts where nutrition plays the biggest role. Mm -hmm. So if you want the biggest impact for a given nutrient, it's going to be during those time periods of most rapid development. Mm -hmm. And so when we think about iron during that first 1000 days, like what, what is iron actually doing in the brain? Is it, is it the framework? Is it the scaffold? Is it, is it connections? What, what's sort of the function of iron during that, during that time period? Yes, 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 and yes. (laughs) And gene regulation. Um, Yeah. So iron actually has an important role in several processes in the brain. Number one, uh, it is involved in the coding, what's called myelin, which is the coding of the nerves that makes the speed of processing faster in the brain. So if you don't have iron, you have less myelin, less of this fatty coding, your brain works slower. Mm-hmm. Number two, it's important for building the brain, energy metabolism. I think most of your folks probably have heard of of energy or ATP, those are the built, those are the energy blocks that, uh, that the, that all cells use to grow and to differentiate. Now, what that means is that the more complex your brain structure, the more capacity your brain has. And iron is important in building that structure, just like you mentioned. Number three, Your brain, you know, anatomy is great, but it's kind of a lump. It just kind of sits there. It has to be connected, right? And the connection is through what are called neurotransmitters. So the two nerves are near each other. They send a little packet of neurotransmitters. Those are proteins. And that stimulates the next nerve to send electricity onwards. Iron is involved in the synthesis of dopamine. People have heard of dopamine, serotonin norepinephrine. So these are major neurotransmitters. And all of that is happening starting at about mid to late gestation and going really rapidly until about two years of age. And finally, iron regulates gene expression. And both very specific genes that are like growth factors for the brain, that, but also geno, what is called genome-wide. They, it helps determine your risk for diseases like schizophrenia, autism, depression, and so on. So very powerful nutrient that does a lot of positive things during brain development. And so 
if you don't have it or you have less than you should have, you're going to compromise your speed of processing, you're going to compromise the structure of the brain, and you're going to compromise the regulation of its function. So it's, yeah, I mean, very complex, very, uh, very important. Um, and you mentioned earlier something about uh, critical windows, or I've heard you talk about critical windows, sensitive time periods when brain development is happening and those nutrients really need to be present there. Right. So what happens when the nutrients aren't right. present there yeah. during those critical periods? Yeah, and I think it's Im just important for the audience to have a distinction of critical periods and sensitive periods. Um, psychologists and neuroscientists argue about this all the time. Um, so a critical period is, as it's implied, a hard stop, meaning if you haven't done, if you haven't built the brain right in that or a part of the brain right in that period, you're just out of luck and it's a lifelong effect. All right. It's pretty harsh. Mm. There aren't a lot of examples of real hard stops, but it, but, but there are some. A sensitive period I look at more and most psychologists look at more as this is your opportunity, folks. This is your chance to do the best that you can. If you don't do it in that sensitive period, it's going to be a lot harder to construct a good brain and therefore the behavior that goes with it. Not impossible, but much harder to do. Mm -hmm. You know, to me, all, all it really means is an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Do it right in the first place. The brain, a baby's brain is very plastic. It's amazing how much recovery it can show you, but that's not the good way to go. The good way to go is to make sure it never gets into trouble in the first place. Yeah, so, we, sorry, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, we hear, you know, the brain is plastic. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, as scientists that's and, and health professionals, that's something we really, we get that, we understand what that means. But I think for a parent, they don't really understand what it means that a brain is plastic. Mm -hmm. Can you can you explain to parents who might be listening out there what you mean by that? Absolutely, I can give you a really dramatic example if you'd like. Sure. Um, you know, so people have uh, adults have strokes, right? Mm -hmm. And if you have a stroke or I have a stroke, even with physical therapy, we are lucky to get back maybe twenty percent of function. It's really tough, right? Uh, and and we all know people who have had strokes. It's, it's, a, it's a tough road back. Mm -hmm. I have babies who have strokes in my newborn intensive care unit, and they come back four months after having same stroke that an adult would have. I can't even tell which side of the brain they had a stroke on. Because wow. they're able to rewire, use new pathways. Perhaps they're still growing the pathways where the stroke occurred, but now there's recovery. So there's a lot of people working on the mechanisms behind uh, that plasticity, because could you imagine if you could bottle that and give it to a spinal cord victim or to yeah. a, you know, injury victim or a stroke victim or something like that. So it's a really fascinating area, but we really don't have the answers there yet. One of the interesting trade-offs though, is that as it's almost like you have the plasticity when your baby can't do much of anything behaviorally. And the trade-off is, is as the baby becomes more specialized and more able to do things, it loses the plasticity. Yeah. So they, there's some conversion that's taking place. And, and the time period that that happens is happens to be called the critical period. Okay. That's when you really need those nutrients. Yeah. And is there still plasticity as uh, throughout childhood or does yes. that sort of diminish greatly diminish over time? Yep. Diminishes over time mm -hmm. and it depends. So, so I think one thing that I think is useful for the audience, actually, for anybody listening, is um, that the br we talk about the brain because it's obviously sitting inside that skull, but it's the brain is actually a bunch of different organs, all uh, or regions and processes that uh, develop all on different time scales. So, for example, the learning and memory part of your brain, something called the hippocampus, develops very early in those first thousand days. Your frontal lobe which mediates important things like mem working memory, um, attention, inhibition, uh, multitasking, all the things we do every day and that every third grader has to do, mm -hmm. develops much later and is still, in fact, developing and showing plasticity through the teenage years and probably up to about the age of 25. So 
there's always plasticity there. And even your memory part of your brain is plastic across the lifespan. That's how you learn things across the lifespan. So when we talk about plasticity, a lot depends on which region we're talking about. Yeah. So fascinating. So fascinating. So iron, you mentioned, we're, we're talking about iron. There are other nutrients that are also important to brain development. Are there other factors that influence healthy brain development? And I'm co- sort of thinking about um, trauma, for example, because I did an interview with uh, Dr. Kelly Fraden on ACEs, mm-hmm. uh, Adverse Childhood Experiences. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm just wondering what kind of other factors are at play here, aside from nutrition, aside from iron specifically, that can influence healthy or not so healthy brain development. Right. So let me let's just stay in nutrition for just a second sure. to say that so the audience knows iron isn't the only important nutrient; it just happens to be the one that I study. Right. It is one of the better known ones in terms of its mechanism, so it's easier. For us in the field to say, listen, if you have iron deficiency at this time point, these are the systems that need the iron in the brain, and therefore these are the behaviors that are going to be affected. Secondly, you can have an acute deficiency, which would cause a brain not to work well. Acute meaning you're deficient right now and your brain doesn't work well right now. You know, if that's all the problem was, you would give the nutrient back and everything would go back to normal. But iron, uh, the polyunsaturated fatty acids, fish oils, Mm -hmm. certain proteins, uh, zinc, um, choline, folate. So these are some of the critical nutrients for brain development. Not only affect the function immediately, but they change the trajectory of how the brain develops such that there are these long-term effects. And if you think about the cost to society in terms of loss of education potential, loss of job potential, um, loss of social potential, it's those long-term effects that are the issue. Mm -hmm. All right. So then if we walk our way back to the early years, not just the first thousand days, but let's say through the age of uh, pre-kindergarten, UNICEF has given a lot of thought to this. There are really three pillars of child development. Number one is nutrition. Number two is what you were talking about, which is reduction of toxic stress, whether it's, you know, whether it's childhood experience stress or true trauma. And the third is nurturing environment and a supportive social system. So those are considered the three pillars of healthy child development, right? Mm -hmm. Then if you ask the question, when are each of those important? Well, they're important all the time. But nutrition seems to be important early on from preconception through those first thousand days. You want to have you want to have low stress the entire childhood. Stress is never good for toxic. Toxic stress is never good for the brain. And interestingly, the social environment piece is more in the second half of the first year through about the age of six. So it's a little bit shifted a little further downstream. and it's important because they all kind of talk to each other. So, so when you ask the question, are there other factors? Yes, absolutely. In fact, stress uh, will change how you use your nutrients, mm-hmm. right? So somebody who is under enormous amount of stress or is infected and has a lot of inflammation, mm-hmm. they don't use the iron to build their brain. They don't use the protein you give them to build their brain. They use it for other things, fight or flight mechanisms, actually. Mm. So, so the systems interact a little bit too, but the three pillars are nutrition, reduction of stress, and social environment. So we want to have all three of those pillars in a good place for a child to really fully develop their potential, their cognitive, intellectual potential. And right. even I read some of your research that suggested uh, a mental health component uh, with, with iron as well. Um, right. And we're just understanding what the biology is behind that. You know, I think when, whenever we talk about nutrition, of course, everybody knows something about nutrition because we all eat, right? I mean, yeah. it's something we do. <laughs> um, I, I think it's always very effective. When I, for example, talk to WIC groups mm-hmm. um, and they are going out with a message of healthy eating, let's say, for their clients, they are much better off in their messaging if they're armed with some biology behind it, meaning that we it's not just an association between a nutrient deficiency and an outcome. 
but we actually know mechanistically how that happens. When it comes to what you asked about, which is um, psychopathology, so autism, schizophrenia, depression, anxiety. Um, for the depression and anxiety, there's good evidence that that comes from the dopamine effect in, 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 um, with iron deficiency. For the schizophrenia and the, and the autism, it comes from epidemiologic studies. So in other words, those are associations. Well, I'll give you an example with the schizophrenia. It was noticed that the women who were starved during the Dutch hunger during World War II, when the Nazis starved the Dutch, it was a very short period of time. Some women were pregnant, right? And those who were pregnant in, in, and in their second trimester and were iron deficient, they're the ones whose kids had a higher rate of schizophrenia when they became adults. Mm. Similar epidemiologic study shows that mom's iron intake at the time of conception and first trimester is related to the risk of autism in that offspring uh, later in life. Well, those are associations and you kind of sit there and go, well, how does that happen? We now can model that and in, in, in preclinical studies, controlled preclinical studies, and we see these gene networks that are affected by iron deficiency in the brain and these gene networks are the ones that code for those diseases, schizophrenia and autism. So now you get a mechanism or, you know, a biological uh, uh, evidence for what people were seeing epidemiologically. So that's, that's the connection. I think it's important for the audience to know that people at the National Institutes of Mental Health are very much into thinking about what are the antecedents, what, are the, what happens early in life that causes some people at risk for schizophrenia or, or depression or autism to have the disorder and others not. What are the environmental factors that we can change? And it turns out nutrition is one of them. Yeah. I actually just read a book not too long ago about schizophrenia. Um, I forget the title off the top of my head, but it was uh, one of the earlier families that had several members of their, um, in their in their family that had schizophrenia and they were one of the sort of model families where they did uh, quite a bit of research on, and they were able to connect choline, mm -hmm. uh, uh, in, in pregnancy. And, and it was really fascinating to read that in a novel because I was like, well, I know that from the research I've read. And now we actually, this is the family that they did a lot of this research on. It's yep. really quite a yeah. full circle moment. <laughs> exactly. Well, in, in, and I think for policy and for people's lifestyle, it's those full circle moments that take you out of that. Well, there was one study that showed this, or I know somebody who had that, you know, that's very confirmatory. And I think what you're, what you're mentioning about the research is actually from our lab that showed that choline, if, if you are iron deficient and you're triggering all of these schizophrenia genes that will last into the adulthood, that choline can actually turn some of those around. Yeah. And so here's a nutrient, potential nutrient prevention or, or therapy. Um, so it's kind of cool to hear that there are families that have actually benefited from that. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about iron. Let's talk about the needs for iron um, and how those change through the lifespan. And, and we can touch on, I'd like you to touch on pregnant women as well. Um, and then... Um, and you've also sort of hinted infancy, obviously pregnancy. You haven't talked too much about that, but perhaps you could expand on that. And then adolescence, when iron needs become more intensified. Um, but then I want to kind of dive into deficiency, iron deficiency, and what what sort of that, how that rolls out um, in real time, real life for mm -hmm. families and for children. Right. Well, so it is the nourished child we're talking about. Yes. <laughs> uh, because there's a whole nother conversation about iron in adults. Yeah. So what is good for, as it were, children isn't necessarily great for adults. And it turns out that the exchange of iron across the, into the brain in adulthood is actually very minimal. Your iron requirements are not high during adulthood. And some adult diseases are actually characterized by a adult neurologic diseases are characterized by iron overload, like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. um, that may or may not be a dietary issue. I don't, we're not here really to talk about that. So let's talk about just the pediatric lifespan. And that is a time when you have high iron requirements. And as you said, 
it's not an equal requirement every single day as you had from conception all the way through 18 years of age or 20 years of age. There are times when you are you have higher iron needs. And the flip side of that coin is you have a higher risk of being deficient. And those time periods are pregnancy um, and therefore <laughs> the end product of pregnancy, which is the baby. So yeah. that's that's one. The very classic, this is the one everybody will have heard of, is the toddler with iron deficiency. So that's your basically nine to three year old, nine month to three year old. And then another peak out in adolescence. And that's mostly in girls because they are having iron loss because of their onset of their periods. So those are the three time periods that you have the greatest iron requirements. Um, what we've learned and some great work by Betsy Lozoff, who was uh, at the University of Michigan, and we all look to her as the kind of the, the goddess of, of, of iron, um, is that we used to think, so, so my group kind of discovered this, that newborns could in fact be iron deficient. And because the thinking before we worked in it was that, oh, the fetus is just great. It just steals all the iron from the mom and they couldn't possibly be deficient. Well, that's not true. They, they can be. And we can talk about some of the conditions in pregnancy that cause that. Yeah. And then the toddlers were thought to be iron deficient because they just weren't getting enough iron in their diet. You know, most people don't eat meat around the world. Uh, it's, it's an expensive way, uh, diet, dietary approach. And many people don't have the resources to eat meat. And then many children around the world lose iron because they lose blood in their stool because they have parasites, intestinal infections, and so on. So that's the more classic toddler iron deficiency <clears throat> that Dr. Lozov studied. And I remember when I first met her and she said, you know, one of these days our two worlds will meet. And what? indeed they did because she did a huge study. This was in China that showed that a lot of the toddler iron deficiency was due to not having enough at birth to start with. And it was therefore the loading of the fetus, having enough iron during pregnancy to feed the mom, the placenta, the fetus, and the fact that what we call the blood volume, you know, the mom expands her blood volume and blood contains iron. So the needs in pregnancy go up enormously. And people have described pregnancy as iron deficiency just waiting to happen. <laughs> I, I feel like I can identify with that because I was iron deficient with my first child. And yeah. If you use a sensitive enough test and, and, and uh, a, a researcher named Michael Auerbach in, in Baltimore showed that 43% of unselected women in the Baltimore area have iron deficiency before they're pregnant. And then if you impose the pregnancy, which is, like I said, now you got a fetus, now you got a placenta, now you got the blood volume, um, it's not surprising the rate goes up from there. In, in, in globally, so globally, some of the rates approach 80%. And what that means simply is that <clears throat> even though the fetus is going to take as much as it can from the mom, eventually the whole system is low mm -hmm. and the fetus doesn't have enough when it's born as a baby. Then, uh, you know, you don't have a lot of dietary iron. There's not a lot of iron in breast milk. Um, and there are probably some good reasons for that. But basically, if you're not loaded with enough iron prenatally before you give birth, then the baby's going to be at risk for earlier iron deficiency after birth. And now a word from our sponsor, Beef Farmers and Ranchers. Did you know that during the first two years of life, a baby's brain grows by 40%. Nutrition is especially important during this critical period of growth and development, which sets the stage for lifelong health. The American Academy of Pediatrics recommends introducing nutrient-dense foods like beef during the transition to complementary feeding to help ensure adequate intake of high-quality protein, iron, zinc, and choline. These nutrients support growing bodies and healthy brain development. Learn more at beefitswhatsfordinner.com. I remember in my training, uh, iron endowment was sort of the, the top you know, 
what we called it. And is there a sense of of the rates of uh, poor iron endowment in infants? Is that something that is trackable? Um, mm-hmm. I know I know pediatricians. You know the recommendations are to check uh, iron at a year, which seems somewhat late uh, given mm-hmm. potential risk for iron deficiency. Um, is that something that's just checked in a scientific lab uh, when when a family's participating in a study? Or are there ways to really get a handle on uh, a baby's iron status early on? Right. So this is an area that's in evolution. I have to be careful what I say because scientifically, I know what uh, you know, I think I know what should be done, mm-hmm. and then there's policy. Sure. And that's always an interesting intersection, right? We do not currently check newborns for their iron status, in spite of so this latest kind of finding of we you might that might be something you want to know now that we know that that's a precursor to postnatal or uh, uh, iron deficiency in children. We, we don't do that routinely. It would involve grabbing cord blood or a blood stick on a baby, um, and it's just not done. However, we do know what the rates of low iron and the risk factors for low iron endowment at birth is. In other words, what are the gestational, what are the conditions, what pregnancy conditions will lead to a baby likely being underloaded and maybe that's the baby you, in your practice if you're, you know, a pediatrician, family doc, practitioner, advanced practice provider, maybe you check those kids a little bit earlier. And they are prematurity, even moderate premature prematurity. You know, even if you're only 34 to 37 weeks, just barely premature, you have not gotten that last bolus of iron that you get in those last 6 weeks. Being small for dates. So this is a little different than being premature. This is where mom might have high blood pressure or a placenta that doesn't work and you get a small baby, even though they might be term. So their iron needs are about twice what a term baby's iron need is. If your mom had, uh, or if if you're the pregnant woman, if you had gestational diabetes or pre-existing diabetes, that seems to shortchange the baby, uh, the fetus, and then the newborn of iron. So those are three groups that I would be looking at before that one year of age. Then there's the issue of how do you screen for iron deficiency? And traditionally, and this is from the adult literature, traditionally you get what's called a hemoglobin or a hematocrit. So you check to see if the person is anemic. Mm -hmm. We do that because it's easy to do. I can do that probably in this room if I have the right equipment. Uh, Somebody can do that in the office. Here's the problem with that. Iron, iron is prioritized to the red blood cells. And what that means is anemia is the last thing that's going to happen. That means that the heart, the brain, the liver, your muscles, all of those tissues become iron deficient before you see it as anemia. Now, if you know that and you know that becoming iron deficient has these long-term implications, you know, it's not deterministic. It's not like you definitely will have them. There's a risk for these longer-term problems. Horse is kind of out of the barn at that point. And, And that's where people are now working on better and earlier tests, particularly in those risk groups that I mentioned, to get more at the iron status rather than at the anemia status. Yeah. I hope that's clear. I can rephrase that if you, if you need no, me to. No, no, that's clear. I, I'm curious about the pregnant mother who has documented iron deficiency because I I know for myself, and I'm probably just a singular case, but once the once I was deficient, like getting sufficient was just a huge mountain to overcome, which I never really overcame it, <laughs> to be quite honest. Right. So there's some good news and some bad news there. Yeah. Um, the bad news is you're right. It's hard to overcome. It's swimming against the tide, Mm -hmm. right? And the reason for that is because that fetus just keeps on growing and the placenta keeps on growing and you keep on growing with your blood volume. It's really hard to get enough iron to do that. 
and oral iron just tastes awful. And yeah. so people just don't like to take it. Yeah. It's hard to catch up that way. And there are some trials now that are going on for people who already present with moderate iron deficiency uh, in the first trimester with giving them just a shot of IV iron. Mm. That is not standard practice, but I think that's something your audience will see being used more over the next five to 10 years. Yeah. Here's the good news. The good news is that um, the fetus is a really good parasite. Um, and so this business of the children taking from the parents, that starts even before they're born and of course continues, you know, for who knows how long afterwards. So it turns out that the placenta, and this is beautiful work by, by Dr. Kim O'Brien that shows that the more iron deficient the mom becomes, the greater the amount of iron the placenta sends over to the fetus. Oh, upregulation so kind of, yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's to protect the fetus yeah. basically. Yeah. However. At some point, and we have some numbers on that, and Dr. Lozoff actually did some work on this. At some point, the whole system is iron deficient, and the fetus will also be deficient, just like the mom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's very interesting because I had the toddler. I had the toddler that was also iron deficient, and I've always yeah. suspected. You know, this was twenty five. She's twenty five. Twenty five years ago, she's smart as a whip. But I suspected back then that. Um, she wasn't an adequately endowed at birth and just also trying to catch up, you know, in those first toddler years. Yeah. You know, I think one of the things that plays into that and that families need to think about is uh, we think of growth, how fast you're growing as a good thing, right? Yeah. Your healthy kid grows well. Yeah. Your healthy kid who's growing well also puts a lot of pressure on the iron system because you need blood, right? Iron is in blood. You need blood to fill that entire space that you're growing. And so the iron demands in a rapidly growing child are much greater than that in a babe, in a child who's not growing as rapidly. Right. So let's tie this back to nutrition and that first thousand days. And we're talking about, you know, at around six months, and my audience knows this, we're starting solids. And it's very important that iron containing foods are a prominent part of that diet. Um particularly if the mother is is nursing. And mm -hmm. um, can you speak to sort of the best ways parents can ensure that their children, their, their young children are getting adequate iron from food sources um, and uh, sort of setting them up for that future of, of great brain growth and development? Right. Well, so again, this is where an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Um, number one is to be healthy during your pregnancy. I just can't emphasize that enough. And it's um, a fully endowed baby at birth has enough iron to last them at least four months and probably up to six months. Mm -hmm. Okay, just exclusively breastfed. And there's a very good, we think, there's a very good biological reason for this. This is work that uh, a nutritionist named Kay Dewey did out yeah. at uh, UC Davis. Um, and she did this great calculation that shows that if you are a baby who was born at term, and importantly, you got delayed cord clamping, I don't know if you've covered that, but that's a great source of iron, yeah. right? You are breastfed, and so you are growing at the moderate rate uh, you, the, you, the baby, are growing at the moderate rate that the World Health Organization growth curves show. You have enough iron there to last at least four months and probably six months. And what that means is that <clears throat> we, we're now realizing that iron supplementation to somebody who does not need iron, that that changes the microbiome, that that sometimes actually restricts growth. And so you know, iron's been kind of described as the bad boy of nutrition. As you know, every nutrient has what we call a U-shaped risk curve. So there's a there's a sweet spot. It's the Goldilocks effect. There's a sweet spot that is just right. And deficiency causes problem more risk and overload causes more risk. So what what was de what's been determined through all of this in the last five to ten years has been that good fetal loading is your first prevention. Mm -hmm. Breastfeeding is is excellent, and you do not 
technically a baby like that probably doesn't need a lot of iron supplementation, if any, in the first couple of months. Mm -hmm. And then the question is, is when do you start to run out? And what foods can you use then to start supplementing? Now, you got to figure that a baby at four to six months fights infection a lot better. So the microbiome maybe isn't quite as, as important as early on in terms of, you know, not shifting it. The, uh, so people have looked uh, at the bioavailability. So how easily does iron that you take in in your diet get absorbed? The bioavailability of iron in breast milk is excellent. Mm -hmm. It's great. Okay. Very, so even though there isn't very much, it's, it's very well absorbed. Elect, what's called electrolytic iron, so that's iron that's put in cereals and so on, isn't particularly well absorbed. It gets in there. It's one way to do it. So starting a complementary foods with cereals is going to get you a small amount of iron. Uh, but I think Nancy, Dr. Krebs, Nancy Krebs' work uh, on, uh, you know, what are your best sources of iron indicates, you know, that, that meats are your best source of iron. Yeah. I mean, that's just biologically true. Yeah. Um, whether, you know, not, not to get into a discussion of, you know, vegetarianism and so on, right. or, but it, just biologically, iron is is very available in in meat sources and as you know we don't tip as pediatricians we don't typically recommend meats for various reasons until after six months so you can kind of now piece it all together to say adequately load breastfeed per the breastfeeding guidelines and then when you introduce foods introduce those with with higher bioavailability yeah so iron and and just for the listeners out there iron is um oh, meat and beef are great sources of iron are good sources of iron but so also zinc choline mm -hmm. b12 some of these other nutrients that are key to brain development as well correct in fact an interesting point about that two two points one Parents will often ask, well, if, you know, can't I just increase the amount of iron or zinc or copper in my diet and have it come across in the milk? And the answer is it doesn't work that way. <clears throat> there are certain nutrients that maternal intake does influence the milk, certain kinds of fats, for example. If you eat more fish, you're going to put more of those fatty, uh, the, the, the long chain polyunsaturated fatty acids, the fish oils, into your milk. But for the metals, zinc, copper, um, iron, that's not the case. So the baby eventually's needs outstrip what the mom can actually put in the milk. Choline is interesting because choline has the ability, apparently, to reverse some of the effects of, of the deficiencies, particularly of iron deficiency. So yeah. that might be protective in a way. Yeah. Uh, I've read some of your research or perhaps listen to you speak about um, scientifically or in research measuring the iron content of the brain. Is that, <laughs> is that a thing? <laughs> um, well, uh, nobody wants their baby's brain biopsy. I, I know, so I know, I know. <laughs> I'm just curious out of like a scientific research standpoint, not a practical application of that, but. Yeah. Um, no, in fact, it's quite difficult to do that and particularly for what we're talking about, which is the deficiency state. So it turns out that uh, you can measure iron content in the brain um, by MRI, by magnetic resonance imaging. There are types of imaging that you can do that looks at the amount of iron in the brain. That's a bit of a false flag because what it's really telling you is storage iron. It's not telling you the functional iron. It's just telling you how much iron storage you have there. Um, and it only tells you sufficient state and overload, but it's very poor at looking at the deficient state. Mm -hmm. There are some researchers out there now, uh, one at, uh, at uh, Baylor and one at University of Pennsylvania, who are getting magnetic resonance sequences, MRI sequences that are starting to be able to detect underload. Mm -hmm. It's a that's an expensive way to tell iron deficiency. Yeah, not very practical, but interesting <laughs> from a research standpoint. Yes, because, again, Dr. Lozoff's work and what we see in the laboratory is that pre-anemic iron deficiency does affect the brain. So you could have a brain that is mildly, moderately iron deficient and not ever see it in the bloodstream. 
with if you're just looking at anemia. And so there's a reason that we are all working on what are called biomarkers or things that you can measure in the bloodstream that tell us about what's happening in the brain independent of what's happening in your blood. Is it fair then to say um, you could be not anemic in the blood, but but have symptom have that's another way of saying what you're what you're saying. You have symptoms of mm-hmm. brain deficiency or iron deficiency in the brain, but you're not seeing it in your in your blood at all. Yes, in fact, in a, a study that Dr. Lozoff did, I think she published in 2008. There's this, you know, scientists say beautiful when they, <laughs> when they mean the data look good. It's not a pretty picture, <laughs> but she looked at engagement. So one of the symptoms of iron deficiency in a child is a lack of engagement. They just, you know, you can see the porch lights on, but they're just not, they just, and and people, they're just not engaging. And people say, well, they must be tired. No, it's actually probably a dopamine effect in the brain. So she looked at engagement in children that were iron sufficient, children that were frankly iron deficient and anemic, and then the middle group. So they were not anemic, but they had signs in their bloodstream that they had low iron. Mm. And then it was a straight line in the sense of the kids who were sufficient were most engaged, the kids who were deficient and anemic least engaged, and that non-anemic group that still had evidence of iron deficiency had that middle ground. So yeah. So engagement. We call it pre-anemic iron deficiency or non-anemic iron deficiency, and there are tests for it. So engagement, is there are there other symptomatology that that might tip one off to uh, signs of just not anemia, but low iron? Yeah. Um they're a little bit nonspecific, which means that they could be due to other conditions as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, but some of the some of the better documented ones that parents could pick up on are restless legs, a lot of uh, motion things, um, and the engagement piece, um, the kind of phlegmatic, I just you know, just not engaged kind of stuff. I think it would be very difficult to tell some of the other biologies that we talked about, speed of processing. How would you know unless you had? you know, an EEG uh, electrodes on, or uh, memory tasks. Well, there's lots of reasons why your memory might not be good. So those are not good screens. But I think that, um, I think the orientation and engagement, and again, um, restless, uh, restless movements. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Uh, Last question for you before we wrap up, what's on the horizon, would you say, for iron research? Well, I think, yeah, that's a very good question. And and I think we can divide that up um, into the global question and then maybe more of the what about in, say, the U.S. or, or, uh, or in, in westernized countries. Globally, one of the biggest issues we didn't even touch on is that malaria, so the plasmodium, the, 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 the organism, loves iron Mm. loves it Mm. and they live inside your red cells and what that means is that if you've got nice iron sufficient red cells like you're healthy you get more you get more malaria oh interesting so that's a problem for many many people around the world is how do they get adequate iron to feed their brain development and blood and everything else without also feeding the malaria so so one of the big areas of research right now is can we get the iron to track to the places we want it to go, but keep away from uh, from areas that we don't want it to go. Um, a recent paper actually showed that, you know, I think we all know why the sickle cells stick around, because that anemia protects you from malaria. It turns mm-hmm. out that iron deficiency is more protective than sickle cell. Wow. That's, yeah. So, You know, kind of be careful what you ask for kind of stuff. And yet those kids have brain development that needs to be fed and so on. So that's one of the big areas that that people are working on. How can we make, how can we treat the malaria and then give them iron to promote their brain development? Mm. I think in the, in, uh, for us in, 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 let's say the United States, I think the issues are, is that shift to thinking more about healthy pregnancy and even iron sufficiency heading into pregnancy 
as a way of ensuring that child's health, who's way down the line still, he's not even a conceptus yet, and he's not even a concept yet, <laughs> but it's going to be important uh, for that kid later on. And then changing that policy uh, or, 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 or finding better markers of iron deficiency before the kid is anemic at one year of age. That's just, in my opinion, it's just an opinion, that's too late in the wrong test. So a lot of us are working on some more sensitive tests that can be done earlier in that first year of the kid to protect their brain. Yeah, I agree with you. I, 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 feel, I, feel, I feel the same way about, you know, that late one-year test, but that's what we have right now, right? So I'm glad for researchers like you, know, you to keep digging into this topic. Yeah, what's funny about that, that policy is that that's American Academy of Pediatrics, and I was involved in writing the previous version of that policy. And in the policy statement, they, they, go, they talk about pre-anemic iron deficiency and the need to have tests for that, mm-hmm. and yet end up saying, well, a year with a hemoglobin. So it'll get rewritten. Yeah. People will really think that as more data comes out. Sure. I think the other thing you're going to see coming forward in this field is a, um, a more nuanced approach to, to supplementation of iron. Mm-hmm. That is, one size doesn't fit all. Not everybody needs to be supplemented. And that newborn babies, we may well move toward a policy of no supplementation for the first couple of months. Every baby has stores and you know, uh, stores from the fetal life. And this concern about the microbiome being shifted to a more to, to one with more pathogens like E. coli and salmonella, that's going to get people to pause about maybe we don't want to give that to a baby who doesn't fight infection very well when they already have iron on board. Yeah. So I, I, and they're already doing that in Europe. I suspect we're going to see that in the States. Interesting. I actually um, interviewed Noel Mueller, who is an uh, infant microbiome expert out of UPenn. And uh, so I'm going to link that show up with your show because I think it's a nice compliment um, for, for listeners to be able to hear both, both ideas. Dr. Georgia, thank you so much for joining me for this discussion. We covered a lot of ground today, but listeners should be sure to check out the show notes at the nourishchild.com forward slash 158 and visit beef. It's what's for dinner.com for more information, including resources and recipes for early child nutrition. Thank you so, so very much. It was great. We could have gone on for another hour. I, I think I so. know we could have, but I I know you're a busy guy, so I will let you go. Thank you, Joe. Hey there, just popping in real quick to ask you if you've heard about the Munch newsletter. It's a weekly paid newsletter I send out to subscribers, and it's a little bit of a different piece of content because I answer reader questions in this newsletter. So complicated stuff stuff that I don't have on the blog and stuff that's not here on the podcast. So I have a section on that newsletter called Ask Me Anything, but I also dive into the latest science around child nutrition. So I translate it for you and give you my perspective on that science. And then lastly, in the newsletter, you'll get a section called Get Educated. And I highlight blog posts, podcast episodes, and other people's resources that I think will be beneficial and helpful to you. So if you're getting my newsletter, I do send out a free newsletter every month. But if you want the deep dive, good juicy stuff that comes in my paid newsletter that comes out every week on Mondays, that's $5 a month or $50 for the whole year, you can check it out. I'll provide a link right here for you, but you can also go to thenourishchild.com and find the sign-up form for the newsletter. Thanks for listening to the Nourish Child podcast, where the number one goal is to help you grow a nourished child inside and out.